tonight. This is genocide. As Russia retreats from Ukraine's capital city, the devastating scene in the suburbs of Kyiv. Plus, our nation is in need of good people to get engaged. Meet the candidate making waves in the country's most expensive Senate race. And how a new commercial aims to spread the gospel to those skeptical of Jesus. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Global outrage as Russia's drawdown around Ukraine's capital of Kyiv reveals possible war crimes. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation in Washington. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jenna Browder. President Biden says Russian President Vladimir Putin should face a war crimes trial over evidence his troops targeted, tortured and killed civilians in Ukraine. Biden today saying Putin needs to be held accountable. That blunt condemnation comes after disturbing new images from the town of Bucha seem to show brutal attacks against civilians. CBN senior Washington correspondent Matt Galka joins us with tonight's top story. Matt? Well, John and Jenna retreating Russian forces from areas around Kyiv gave way to apparent atrocities going on against the people of Ukraine. President Biden says he'll push for new sanctions as the United States and allies start building a case for an international war crimes trial. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited Bucha, a town on the outskirts of Kyiv, where Ukrainian officials claim the Russian military killed hundreds of civilians before retreating. It's war crimes that will be recognized as genocide by the world. You're here and you see what has happened. We know about thousands of killed and tortured people. The graphic images showing Ukrainian people in the street body bags, and a mass grave outside of the Church of St. Andrews. Zelensky making another plea for support at the Grammy Awards Sunday night. Tell the truth about the war on your social networks, on TV, support us in any way you can, any but not silence. As Biden again went after his Russian counterpart, he referenced Bucha as sufficient evidence to try Putin for international war crimes. You saw what happened to Bucha. This warrants him, he is a war criminal. But we have to gather the information. We have to continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons they need to continue the fight. And we have to gather all the detail so this can be an actual have a war crime trial. This guy is brutal. And what's happening in Bucha is outrageous. And everyone's seen it. The State Department said Monday they believe the atrocities were not the act of rogue soldiers, but the acts of a troubling campaign. Russia called the reports and images coming out of Bucha fake, with State Department officials calling that denial baseless and shameless. Right now, at the request of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, the United States is supporting a multinational team of international prosecutors to the region to directly support the efforts of the Prosecutor General's War Crimes Unit to collect, preserve, and analyze evidence of atrocities with a view towards pursuing criminal accountability. We must not become numb, as you heard from the secretary yesterday, to the realities of Putin's brutality. The president promised to seek more sanctions with his advisors, saying earlier today those details will come out later this week. Some members of Congress would like to see Russia's energy sector hit. Meanwhile, Europe continues to respond, with Germany expelling 40 Russian diplomats and Lithuania kicking out Russia's ambassador from their country. John and Jenna. All right, Matt Kalka, thank you so much, Matt. Well, at least six and a half million people have been displaced since the war began in Ukraine a little over a month ago, and more than four million refugees have fled crossing the border into neighboring countries. As they make their way to safety, some are finding shelter and comfort at a temporary haven staffed by CBN's Orphan's Promise. George Thomas reports from Ukraine. Vitalina Zinotka says she'll never forget the day Russian soldiers first appeared on her street. We saw them approaching from our basement through a crack in the window. Zinotka, her husband, two sons and mother are from Ukraine's southern city of Kherson. On March 11th, nine days after seizing control of Kherson, Russian troops started fanning out to outlying villages like Zinotka's. They came into our house with their machine guns and they didn't even bother to take their shoes off. 
Zenotka told CBN News that the men were drunk and started intimidating her husband and 18-year-old son. I felt like my heart was being squeezed. It felt like my soul was being squeezed. And it was even very hard to breathe because I was so fearful. She slipped into an adjacent room where her mother and 13-year-old son were and whispered to them to pray. I told my mom to pray that God would rescue us. The Russians demanded to see their passports. They were looking at our documents and trying to make sense of them, but they couldn't because they were drunk. Zenorka says their desperate prayers were suddenly answered. They were still walking around the house, pointing their guns at us, and praise God, they just left. Zenotka and her husband escaped this past Saturday under heavy fire as Ukrainian forces attempted to retake Kherson. They headed west from Kherson to Ternopol, where CBN's Orphans Promise runs this training center for children, now converted to house fleeing refugees. We are truly thankful for them hosting us. It's very comfortable. It's a very warm atmosphere. We were fed well. It's an amazing work that they are doing. The staff at Ternopol Training Center began gathering supplies within hours of war erupting. It started with us bringing our own mattresses from home. We had six to start with and were ready to host 10 people. The next day we received more mattresses and we were ready to host another 35 refugees. Ofen's Promise bought this two-story building in 2014 with the goal of reaching children and their families with the gospel. They would hold English classes Monday through Thursday and teach Bible lessons using CBN Superbook on Friday. Some 230 children and young adults showed up every week. We would teach them about God's law and the meaning of Christ's coming and resurrection. War has the students now taking classes online. Staff members also hold regular online prayer meetings and counseling sessions when needed. The fact that we can continue these lessons online brings peace to both us and them. As refugees poured in, neighbors who lived around the Orphan's Promise Center started pitching in. Some cooked, others brought supplies. Parents with children at the center also got involved. We united in the cause of helping people, serving people, because they have needs. The city of Ternopol here in the western part of Ukraine has been sort of a rest stop for those who are making their way out of the country. And according to the latest statistics from the center, they say that close to about 600 people have passed through their doors since the start of the war. The majority of those, like 17-year-old Anastasia, staying at the Orphan's Promise Center for a night or two. She fled from Sumy, northeast of Kyiv, where Ukrainian forces are launching fierce counterattacks against Russian forces. I hope I will wake up from this nightmare soon and it will be all over. Zenorka's family heads further west in the morning to stay with friends. Staying here is an example of how Ukraine has become one family. Yet there is no place she'd rather be than home. I really want to go back, but I'm afraid. It would be very painful because everything is destroyed and I don't know if I can handle that right now. George Thomas, CBN News, Ternopol, Ukraine. Coming up, we hit the campaign trail in Pennsylvania. Meet a candidate hoping to overcome her big spending opponents and make it to the U.S. Senate. Welcome back. In a crowded field, Kathy Barnett is hoping to set herself apart. She wants to represent Pennsylvania in the U.S. Senate, and she's using her life story as a backdrop for her campaign. Conceived out of tragedy and raised in poverty, Barnett's personal testimony fuels her message on the trail, that God has a plan for every life. David Brody has the story. Yeah. <laughs> when voters in Pennsylvania meet Kathy Barnett, they see smiles and hear a straightforward message. Everything is on fire. Our nation is in a nosedive. Behind the rhetoric is a deeper story. I grew up in a home with no insulation, no running water, an outhouse in the back and a well on the side. While a childhood of poverty is tough enough, Barnett's entry into the world could be considered a miracle. I am the byproduct of a rape. My mother was 11 years old when I was conceived. My father was 21. And I am so grateful to God that there were adults in the room. I'm so grateful to God that there were 
you know, people who came alongside my very young mother when she was in a very broken place. And there I was <laughs> in her womb. I had, I took no part in how I was conceived. And yet there I was, they saw me as someone with value. <laughs> I'm so grateful, how simple. And yet today we have murdered over 63 million babies because somehow we have convinced ourselves that that life has no value, that that life has no purpose. My life is valuable. My life has purpose. Barnett didn't find out about this part of her life until joining the military in her late teens. Looking at her birth certificate for the first time, she did the math, asked questions, and reached out to her mom and then made peace. Well, all of that was blocked out until my daughter brought it to my attention. I, I never talked about it. I never wanted them to think about it. I thought I kept it hid from them, but mm. I should have realized they had their birth certificate. After the reconciliation came another meeting that would change her life. Barnett found Jesus after a dream about the book of Revelation. She heard an audible voice saying, go back home, and recalls telling God something specific on the way. I mean, if you are real, and if you can really save my life, and I won't be a hypocrite like some that I've seen growing up as a child, then I want you. And I believe it was during that time from on that train ride from California to Alabama that I gave my life to the Lord. It all started to make sense for her. And I can see how at the age of 19, how he grabbed my hand and he began to show me my purpose and how everything about me is by design. You know, the word of God says that it is him who, who decides the day and the, the time and the place where we would be born. Barnett became the first in her family to finish college, saw success in the corporate world, and is now running for United States Senator. I know what matters most to you and your family because I am you. As a homeschooling mom of two, she's tired of the indoctrination. Oh, we have critical race theory that goes into classroom and teaches little white kids that because of the color of your skin, you're evil, right? It is racist and it is wrong. If she wins, Kathy Barnett would become the U.S. Senate's first black Republican woman. She makes a habit of calling out Democrats for using black voters to their advantage. What exactly have we gotten for our loyalty? Right? We know what Democrats get. They cannot secure the White House without getting 92 to 95 percent of the black vote. So they get the White House. Well, what exactly have we gotten? The May primary is hotly contested in a state that could determine which party controls the Senate. It's a crowded GOP field. David McCormick has many high profile endorsements and he leads the field. Former talk show host Dr. Oz is in the race and has name recognition. While Barnett polls in the single digits, she's gaining a strong grassroots following. She points out that neither opponent is from Pennsylvania. Barnett, who's lived there for almost a decade, wants to make sure voters get that message. These carpetbaggers <laughs> have been spending Buku's millions. Within the first two weeks of February, Oz had already spent $7 million. Just the first two weeks. Who does that? She pitches herself as a citizen legislator, such as the founders intended. Our nation is in need of good people to get engaged. Our nation is in need of those who will take a long-term custodial view of our country. Our country does not have long-term custodians. How do you define success? What are you trying to accomplish as you, as you win here? Because God can, God's a God of miracles. He can take you all the way to the U.S. Senate and he can do something else with your life. I want to um, finish this race and hear the Lord say, well done. <laughs> My good and faithful servant, you ran your race. That was in front of you. God bless America! She wants an America that gives others the opportunities that she got. Her supporters are praying for her to do just that here in Pennsylvania. We give you glory and honor and praise and we thank you once again for Kathy and this commitment that she's made. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
David Brody, CBN News in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. All right, thank you, David. We'll hear with us now Nathan Gonzalez, editor and publisher of Inside Elections. Nathan, welcome. Let's start with Kathy Barnett. She is a candidate with a compelling life story, uh, but can she break through a crowded primary with bigger names and bigger campaign war chests and win in a state like Pennsylvania? Well, it's going to be difficult. I mean, I, I like that package in part because it shows us that these candidates are real people, right? We can talk about politicians, stuff, but these are real people putting their lives out there to run for office. And uh, David did a good job of laying out the difficulty in the primary. Um, Kathy's actually been in the race for quite some time and had some early fundraising strength. But since then, the race has gotten very crowded. And there is a spending war between Dr. Oz and David McCormick on TV. But then there are also other candidates. There's a, a Jeff Bartos, who ran for lieutenant governor a few cycles. Um, Carla Sands, who is an ambassador de to Denmark under with the Trump administration, that are also jockeying for position. And the primary is coming up on May 17th, which isn't that far away. So even if um, Barnett's message of uh, being an outsider and a citizen politician is probably the right message, it's, it's difficult to keep up with the spending. Yeah. Um, Inside Elections re released its first overall projection for the Senate in the midterms. You actually think a, a change is in the majority is likely. Tell us more about your analysis. Yeah, well, we sh we've learned to be open-minded about outcomes in elections, and there are a lot of things that could happen. But right now, we see the most likely outcome in the U.S. Senate in November is that Republicans gain between one and three Senate seats, and they only need one in order to get the majority. Um, now, that means Democrats could maintain control. Republicans could even gain more than three seats. But right now, one to three is the most likely outcome. And Pennsylvania is critical because Democrats have multiple vulnerable Democratic senators. Uh, and so if, if they lose any of their senators, they're going to have to try to pick up some Republican seats to balance those out. In Pennsylvania, uh, which we've talked about, in Wisconsin are are Democrats' two best opportunities to win a Republican seat to try to balance out losses uh, elsewhere. David, Inside Elections also rated House races, though those rankings are incomplete due to redistricting. Nathan, do you envision a gavel change there as well? Yeah, I actually think that a gavel change is more likely in the House. Republicans are well positioned. Uh, on average, the president's party loses 30 House seats in midterm elections, and uh, Republicans only need to gain five. And that that's an easier task considering President Joe Biden's low job approval rating. But we don't have a specific range, as you mentioned, because we're still waiting on a handful of states to finish redistricting. And until we know what some of these specific districts look like and who's who's running, uh, that puts that specific projection on pause. But I think Republicans are better positioned in the House than they are in the Senate. Yeah, we'll have to see how those uh, those those pieces fall. A former Governor Sarah Palin announced she's running for Alaska's congressional seat, picking up former President Trump's endorsement. Uh, Nathan, care to comment on that race and maybe why Governor Palin decided to run? Well, you will have to ask Palin ourselves whether you know her ultimate motives. But this race is going to be wild. There are 51 candidates, John and Jenna, running for this special wow. election. Uh, it's going to be in June, and it's a slightly different system. Alaska has moved to a top four ranked choice system. So in June, all 51 candidates will be on the ballot. Voters will rank their top four, and the top four that make it through that will then move to an August special general election. Palin has to be considered one of the top candidates because of her profile in the state. She's been endorsed by former President Trump. So I expect her to make the top four. But then when you start ranking, you know, when voters are making rank mm -hmm. choice and, and have other candidates yeah. from other parties or maybe an independent in the race, things could get messy, but she has to be, mm. uh, she could be coming to Congress, uh, but we have a ways to go before we know for sure. All right, Nathan Gonzalez of Inside Elections, thank you so much. Great to have you tonight. Thank you. A new massive ad campaign aimed at changing negative perceptions of Christianity, starting with conversations about Christ, next on Faith Nation. Welcome back. It's called the biggest Christian ad campaign ever broadcast, a $100 million effort urging people to reconsider just who Jesus is. It's called He Gets Us, and as Heather Sells reports, the ads are meant to make Jesus relatable to people from all walks of life. The campaign is aimed at people who are skeptical about Jesus and don't know much about his ministry. The hope that it will start a new national conversation. Anxiety ran high, hatred rose, 
I'll prepare a feast and bring them together, he thought. The ads portray Jesus as compassionate and someone who understands, whether it's our anxiety or a crisis pregnancy. Her parents thought her boyfriend was the father, but the baby wasn't his. He loved her, so he offered to raise the child with her. So we looked at Jesus' life and we looked at what American public was going through right now and just said, what are the things that are most relevant to people? Jason Vanderground of the creative firm Haven worked with Christian donors and a massive $100 million budget to reintroduce Jesus to the public. The main goal is just to increase the respect in the personal relevancy of Jesus. The campaign includes 17 video ads, radio spots, and billboards. It also provides opportunities to chat, text, and read passages of scripture. It's guided by research that shows many adults aren't sure of what they believe and have negative thoughts about Christianity. The hope of the He Gets Us campaign is that might actually Maybe dig a little deeper who Jesus is. Maybe Dr. Ed Stetzer, executive director of Wheaton's Billy Graham Center, says the timing is key, as well as the strategy. We want to uh, encourage people during this moment, a time of confusion and division, that maybe this is an opportunity not to vent about everything we have an opinion about on social media, but talk to our friends and neighbors about Jesus who've seen these ads. The Heat Gets Us campaign will run through the end of 2022 and reach a wide array of Americans and potentially start all kinds of new conversations. Heather Sell, CBN News. Finally tonight, a telltale sign spring has sprung in the Evergreen State, Washington Skagit Valley Tulip Festival officially getting underway. The deep-rooted annual Northwest celebration showcases millions of vibrant flowers for the whole month of April. This is God created a giant paintbrush and laid it out on April 1st for us, and this is where we are. And the month-long festival includes art shows, a gala, and a tulip-themed parade. It attracts spectators from all over the world, including more than 85 foreign countries. Organizers say the best time to see the tulips is the second week of April. I really, Those are stunning. They are beautiful, and I really liked his description. It's like God's giant paintbrush. It does look like that. It's just, be yeah, it's just beautiful. Love the colors. Well, thank you so much for watching this edition of Faith Nation. Have a great night.